Lessons from our centenarians, extra routines, patterns for greatest um, longevity. Lots of fun. Everyone I talk to, bar none, wants to live as long as possible and with a good quality of life. And fortunately, there is new data, there's evidence accumulating models of people who are doing exactly that. The number of people projected to reach 100 years of age and beyond and to do it in good fashion is climbing, and that's also in this country. Uh, it's a very exciting time, quite frankly. Okay. So I'll ask our video guys, my, my slide isn't advancing here. Is there some guys in the audio, audio, or sorry, in the video department, just backstage, sorry. Thanks, Charles, I'm, it seems stuck, I'm not sure. There you go. It, it's, it's done that before, and then it. Yep. Looks good. Looks good. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So lots of people have been asking about speaking notes and um, looking at the slides one more time. They're available through the conference. I'll also have these talks on my website um, within within a matter of weeks following the program, so they'll be available there. If you go to the website, um, you can find them, or you'll, have, you'll be prompted to enter your email. If you enter your email, you will um, get an email, and I'll say they're available, this is how you watch them, and um, you can have access to everything that, everything that happened here today, so that's coming up. Again, this is broad informational topics, can't make specific recommendations to you as an individual because I'm not your doctor and I don't know the details of your health, so these really are um, broad informational topics and your medical decisions are, are really up to you. Our first topic today, as we wind into longevity, rest and sleep. We need to speak about this. We spend a quarter of our lives sleeping, or at least we should, and it would behoove all of us to do that in good fashion. So sleep or die, a growing body of research warns of heart attacks, dementia, and strokes for people who don't sleep properly. Um, here's an article that I appreciated. Sleep deprivation is killing you and your career. Short-term productivity gains from skipping sleep, sleep to work are quickly lost. Sleep deprivation is detrimental to mood, ability to focus, and access to higher brain levels of function for days to come following missed sleep. So your brain, while you're asleep, removes toxic proteins, which are byproducts of the nervous activity while you're awake. Your brain can remove these adequately only during sleep. So without sleep, toxic proteins remain in your brain cells and they impair your ability to think and to function. So uh, sleep deprivation beyond that linked to a very variety of serious health problems, heart attack, stroke, type 2 diabetes, obesity. With sleep deprivation, the stress hormone cortisol is overproduced. This is damaging our immune systems. It's breaking down our skin collagen, so we lose that smoothness, smoothness and elasticity, start to look old. The expression, get your beauty sleep, is um, not at all inappropriate. Sleep deprivations make, make us hunger, hungry, and it's harder for us to satisfy that hunger. Our appetite hormones are shifted. There's increased ghrelin, which stimulates your appetite, and reduced leptin, which is your, which is your satiating hormone, so it's, you work harder to feel full. And doing that late at night when you should be sleeping is um, really a disaster to any weight management program. Those who sleep less than six hours a night are 30% more likely to become obese than those who get seven to nine hours. Most people need seven to nine hours of sleep to feel sufficiently rested. Few people are at their best with less than seven hours and few require more than nine. So sleeping forever, there's a law of diminishing returns. You don't need to. More than half of Americans sleep less than the necessary seven hours. A third of US workers get less than six hours of sleep. Sleep deprivation is caused costing businesses in the United States $63 billion annually in lost productivity, and that would be proportional for Canada as well. Beyond the obvious sleep benefits of thinking clearly and staying healthy, 
ability to manage your emotions, remain calm under pressure, um, is directly linked to your performance. So if you're losing your temper, blowing up at work all the time, you know, that's not going to serve you well. And if sleep is the culprit, it's something we can quickly fix. Good sleep hygiene is something we can all improve to get the best quality of sleep um, that's available for us. So here is a very recent study um, published in 2015. Another reason to get enough sleep is Alzheimer's disease. Very interesting um, piece of research here published in a very prestigious, prestigious journal, Nature Neuroscience. This is the highest quality of publication. More than 5 million Americans already have Alzheimer's and that should double by 2050. Changes leading to Alzheimer's can begin 20 years before your memory loss is observed. So even if you don't have Alzheimer's now, you may be developing the substrate for Alzheimer's later in life. So it becomes a vicious cycle between poor sleep and beta amyloid protein deposition. This is a signature protein that lays down, accumulates in your brain, and disrupts brain function. So your brain uses sleep to flush out toxic debris. And the less sleep you have, the less beta amyloid clearance you have, the more that builds up, and as a result of it building up, the worse your quality of sleep. Lots of elderly people um, struggle with sleep, and um, here is one of the possible conditions that's working against everyone. So sleep is critical as we age, and again, it's a modifiable risk factor. We really can improve. Um, but be aware that sleeping properly now is gonna be protective for your mental health you know, later in life and beyond. So here's another study, let's put a different twist on it. Too much sleep could kill you. And that's a 2011 sleep um, study. Self-reported sleep less than 6.5 hours or greater than 7.5 hours has been predicted by some to increase your mortality. So here's a study of 400 plus women, average age 67.6 years, followed for 10.5 years. And they actually had measurements of their sleep. So their sleep was objectively confirmed by monitoring brain rhythm patterns to confirm that they were in fact sleeping so we could really quantify what point, what, how much time they were truly sleeping rather than just reporting that they were sleeping. And the optimal time of sleep for those people who were really proven to be sleeping, five to 6.5 hours. Time in bed, sleep efficiency, um, melatonin metabolite excretion, um, were all significant mortality risk factors, but really that actual sleep time less than the self-reported sleep time um, to be at maximum benefit. So there was this U-shaped relationship between survival and sleep. Get really too little and your survival goes down. Get too much and your survival goes down. There's an optimal amount. It's different for everybody. It's not up to you. It's not up to me. We need to figure out what we... Um, need and expect it to be um, within those ranges. So here's the actual data from that study. We have proven sleep with lowest risk ratio um, here being in the 360 to 390 um, minute range of sleep, which is that five to 6.5 hour range. And the associated survival curves associated with each of those sleep duration patterns, which were proven to genuinely be sleep. Um, so let's be aware of that data. Ten features of superb sleepers. And can you find something in here that you can improve upon? If you can, it was worth your time, um, you know, being in our session this morning. Superb sleepers welcome dreams, even the challenging ones. Dreaming is natural, it's healthy, and it supports emotional well-being. Um, pays to be open and receptive to the mystery of our dreams. Most insomnia occurs during the latter part of sleep. That's when REM sleeping or the deepest sleep and dreaming occurs. Be on good terms with your dreams to stay in the game that is soundly asleep all night. Superb sleepers typically awaken without an alarm. Who needs an alarm? I need an alarm so I have room to improve. Know how much sleep you need. Go to bed on time to allow for sleep. Um, good sleepers know when they will awaken and naturally. Routine alarm clocks. Routine alarm clock awakening is snipping off um, the important parts of your sleep. If you're sound asleep when the alarm clock goes off, um, there's, something, there's something wrong and you need to restructure how you're sleeping. 
Super sleepers have an intuitive regard for routines and rhythms. These are rhythm people. Rhythms are the infrastructure of sleep. Routines a personal dance to obtain those rhythms. Modern life is dysrhythmic and staccato. We've quit complaining against about the rat race that we're all living in because we have to because the rat race has become so unavoidable. Um, pays to develop rhythms in our lives, rhythms to improve the quality of our sleep. Root superb sleepers are ex accepting a period of nighttime wakefulness. Waking up occasionally doesn't affect your overall quality of sleep. Don't fret. It's okay to get up for a few minutes even and enjoy the stillness of the night and historically common to awaken and stretch in the middle of the night. So these are routine patterns. They say animals, like a dog, will get up and circle his bed several times during the night, and that's probably actually facilitating um, the sleep. So we can accept these things too, and don't feel like you're doing it wrong just because you wake up on occasion. Superb sleepers have faith in their own ability to sleep. They're confident that they can access sleep. It's available to them whenever they need it. Um, they know how to truly let go, forgive the loose ends of the day, unresolved things can be addressed more effectively tomorrow after a good night's sleep. Superb sleepers have a direct sense of sleep. It's more than the absence of awakening. It's a really a different kind of experience that they're aware of and value. Um, they have a sense of the subtle touch of sleep and submit gracefully to sleep and um, anticipate being asleep very well. Uh, superb sleepers tend to be on good terms with themselves. You don't need endless pre-sleep activities or entertainment. You're comfortable spending a few minutes alone in the dark while you're falling asleep, and it's okay to surrender gradually. Don't feel like you're losing productivity uh, just because you didn't fall asleep the minute your head hit the pillow. Don't fight occasional daytime sleepiness. Um, sleepiness by day is a visit of something better to come at night. Don't argue and shoo away your little sleepy spells. Um, superb sleepers tend to be superb nappers. 15 to 20 minutes of napping in the middle of the afternoon um, can really contribute to an excellent sleeping regime. And superb sleepers love to sleep. They really love and look forward to a delightful sleep. Slip into bed, surrender to gravity, um, your waking mind disperses, feel it let go, enjoy this. It's not an escape from waking, it's an experience that absolutely enhances life. So sleeping, you know, really is our friends, and this is something that we should learn to embrace um, a little bit more hardcore. Stay away from sleeping pills if it's at all possible. Whatever you're taking, NyQuil, Benadryl, Valiant, Ambien. You know, I prescribe these things in the hospital when people are only going to be there a couple of days, and the hospital environment is completely rattling to people. Very reluctant to send um, anyone home with these sorts of prescriptions. So your mind is cycling through elaborate series of stages. These chemicals mess that up. You're shuffling through the day's memories. You're deciding what to store and what to discard. Part of that's the dreaming process. And let's worry about caffeine. What about our caffeine intake? It's a powerful stimulant that interferes with sleep. It increases adrenaline. Caffeine has a half-life of six hours. So a cup at 8 a.m. is still 25 present in present in someone's body at 8 p.m., the time you should be winding down, and this can disrupt your deepest periods of sleep, um, what we know as rapid eye motion sleep or REM sleep. Here's what is a problem with our newly acquired modern lifestyles, and that's avoiding blue light at night. Morning sunlight happens to be concentrated in blue light, and this halts melatonin production, which is your sleep hormone, it gives you alertness, makes you feel more alert. The afternoon sun, interestingly, tends to lose that blue light, al allowing your melatonin um, stores to accumulate in preparation for sleep. And all of our devices, our laptops, our tablets, our mobile phones, are all emitting short wavelength blue light, and we hold these right up to our faces we can, where we can see them, and we check them until the morning we go to bed. It's impairing melatonin, it's confusing our brains. Best advice is to avoid this after dinner, or if you must look, there are filters or even protective glasses. Um, the little devices that are supposed to make our lives so much more convenient um, are really um, damaging to our sleep patterns, which is affecting us. Another tip, wake up at the same time every day. Consistency is key. Regulates your circadian rhythm. Improves your mood and sleep quality. Your brain will acclimate to feel rested and refreshed. 
Resist the temptation to sleep in when you feel tired. Sleeping in on the weekends is a bad idea because it interrupts these cycles. Get out of bed, there's other things to do. You can still be enjoying a restful time on the weekends without um, laying in bed. And that's a big lesson for, for me and I have a feeling many other people. So again, no binge sleeping on the weekend, counterproductive way to catch up, inconsistent with your wake up time, messes up your circadian rhythm, you'll feel groggy and tired, which may be okay on the weekend, you'll also be less productive on Monday, and that won't help you look good. So learn how much sleep you really need, it's almost beyond your control. Uh, most people are sleeping less than what they really need, most are underperforming in life as a consequence. The science is unequivocal, when we get enough sleep, everything is better. Our health, our mental capacity and clarity, our joy at life, our ability to live life without reacting to every bad thing that happens um, with a short temper. So let's um, you know, work on improving the quality of our sleep and stop working. 60% of people are said to be checking their work emails right to the moment of sleep. So we need to stay off the blue light devices and allow ourselves to relax and prepare for sleep. Um, eliminate interruptions that are under your control. You know, there are earplugs for loud neighbors and um, don't drink too much water in the evening to avoid um, too many bathroom breaks. When all else fails, take naps. Interestingly, melatonin production is peaking around one to three o'clock in the afternoon, so it's okay to feel a little bit sleepy in the afternoon. Some companies like Google is taking advantage of this or recognizing the importance of this and offering short naps to their employees and um, encouraging them to take it. Uh, so don't feel bad because some very um, powerful companies are taking action on this. You might experience an overwhelming desire to sleep in the afternoon if your sleep at night is poor. Short naps, 15 minutes, is better than reaching for, for another cup of coffee or, or cheating in some such way. Setting an alarm might be the only thing that helps you get up in the morning, but try setting one to remind you when to go to bed at night. Have an alarm that says you need to be in bed at this time so you're not encroaching endlessly on your sleep schedule. Having warm feet can help you sleep. Put on a pair of socks. Um, to speed you up and you might be surprised how quickly you fall asleep when your feet are actually warm. Even the smallest amount of light can disrupt your sleep patterns. Keep your bedroom as dark as possible for the best night's sleep. You know, do you need to blacken your curtains? Things like this can be life-changing um, with the small adjustments um, that we make. I think we've talked about changes in our lifestyles that can really bring us to the 90th percentile of health and now we're going for gold really um, trying to move as close to 100% in terms of optimizing our, our lifestyles in a healthy way. And these are the little tips that really can make a difference. Um, exercise regularly, you'll sleep better. Just a few minutes of physical activity really can help um, your body react, so um, relax. So really try not to um, deny yourself. A trend called color in your bedroom can make for a restful tone, which can facilitate sleep. If you're commuting, limit your naps to 30 minutes. Don't do it too close to bedtime. Um, then it won't interrupt your night's sleep. Get sunlight first thing in the morning. Triggers your brain to stay awake and alert early in the day. Helps you ease into sleep a little earlier at night. Um, so for those of us in northern climates, this can be um, difficult. But when the opportunity is there, uh, we can seek sunlight. sunlight. How about this? Who likes to sleep on their left side? We got a few. It's actually physiologically better to sleep on your left side. So if you're there already, congratulations. If you're not there, um, think about it. The, our lymphatic system relies on the left side. Your gallbladder, your pancreas, are better able to dispose of waste and um, while producing digestive enzymes on your left side. So they've, they've monitored esophageal pH, or for acid content in your, in your esophagus, for four hours after a high fat meal to monitor for reflux. And the total reflux time is significantly greater, 230 minutes for people who are laying on their right versus laying on their left. And overall acid clearance is also proportionally prolonged for the right-sided sleepers. So if it's at all possible or you don't care, you know, make the effort to lay on your left side and watch your sleep um, improve. Again, we're going for that final 10% of optimization of our routines. 
Speaking of routines, morning rituals for a better day. Make or break time that sets you up for a good day or a bad day. What happens first thing in the morning? And um, I know I have lots of mistakes first thing in the morning and um, you know, even working through some of these topics is really such a motivation to improve. Ooh. Waking up. One stretch to wake up your body. This is interesting. Um, a, for those of us who work long hours at a desk or in front of a computer, upper and mid-back tends to get very tight. Here's a stretch, first thing in the morning that can really prime you for your day. You go on all fours, reach up to the sky with your arm, then on your hands and knees, thread the needle just as the, um, as the girl in the picture is doing. Breathe for several breaths, repeat the other side, and you're already starting to um, loosen up your back. Nice way to break into the day. Um, there's even recommendations for more extensive stretching routines. Again, what you can do in your, bath, in your bedroom lasts only a couple of minutes. Do it before your shower or after your shower when you get straight out of bed. can go a long way to setting you up to um, feeling um, physically limber uh, the rest of the day. Morning rituals that can change your life. And this is one that I have adopted in the last couple of weeks and I'm sticking to it. And that is drink a glass of warm lemon water. Excellent way to get your body going. Um, warm water or not cold water so it's not a shock to your system. Engage in, the, you know, engage in the rehydration process. You've been for eight hours without water and don't pass on water for breakfast or when you're reaching for other beverages. Start with the water, nice tall glass of water, and add lemon and we'll understand why. Wake up early. If you're going to have a fantastic morning routine to get your day off to a great start, you're going to need just um, a little bit more time to get that done. Give yourself an hour and a half before you have to be out the door. Um, follow your circadian rhythms if at all possible, but start to plan for a good morning routine before you burst off to work. Scrape your tongue. Have you ever, anyone here scrape their tongue? We've got tongue scrapers. This is really, really um, a very nice addition and something I've started recently. It's a reju rejuvenation process, helps you wake up. You taste your food better. You can buy plastic things like this at your drugstore. That's almost exactly what I have. And um, away you go. A few minutes in the morning, you get that nice pink tongue back, maybe something you haven't seen for a long time. And, um, you know, what a nice little addition. Uh, a stretching routine, we've already talked about that. Wakes up your muscles, um, gets them ready for the day. This is a great tip. How about these little trampolines that you sometimes see in people's house? One suggestion is get one and rebound a hundred times. Little bounces on your mini trampoline. I know Tony Robbins, before his, he goes out on stage to fire up these big audiences at convention centers, has a trampoline backstage and is doing this. Light bouncing stimulates lymph movement and drainage. So it really gets processes circulating in your body even when you're at a zero impact level. So you don't have to be super fit, you don't have to be getting air off of the trampoline, just that little um, light bouncing can get your body circulating in important ways, helps you stay energized, firm up your whole body, and you'll notice that your body is um, tightening in healthful ways um, by 100 bounces. So a nice little investment that really is um, probably accessible to just about um, anyone who can walk in balance. Really, really nice. Um, listening to music, inspirational, motivational readings. Set yourself up for success. Get in the right mindset to greet the day. Your mind is hungry for new information. You can feed your mind every day. Be careful because songs can get stuck in your head. Um, but really, some positive information, inspirational, motivational um, messages at the start of your day uh, really can set your brain on the right course. Green smoothies are nice, and this is something we haven't talked about. I am a blender, blending multi-vegetables um, for the purposes of having dense nutritional content easily and first thing in the morning. Uh, I know this is taking off um, for a lot of people. Green smoothies with spinach, kale, green leafy vegetables, lots of phytonutrients, fibers and mineral, lots of plant source energy right at the start of your day. Within 30 minutes you can check back and see how much better you feel. But this hits your system fast and, um, and um, can really get you off to a great start. Here's some tips um, alluding back to our talk um, at the start of the week on mind-body connection. Smile at yourself in the mirror for 30 seconds. 
Smile, boost your self-esteem, connect with the part of yourself that's running in the background, getting the most important things done. And that's the subconscious processes that you're engaged in that are um, really holding so much of your life together. Smile, even a little hint, like you've got some tricks up your sleeve and you're ready to show the world what you can do, is perfect. You'll actually engage your, engage your subconscious a little bit more strongly. Give yourself that look of determination to make it through the day and accomplish your goals and be surprised at the little bit of inspiration that this time of connecting with your own self in the morning um, can do. You're probably looking in the morning anyway, you're brushing your teeth or you're showering, you can be smiling and winking at yourself at the same time, it's just a little switch. Here's a nice suggestion and something that I need to pursue myself. Write out your top three for the day. Three things you really want to get done and above all, get those three things done. You have confidence for bigger problems. Notice small stuff on your list just isn't any important anymore and it tends to fade away. Just three, not more, because if you list four or five, you may not get them done and you'll feel discouraged. discouraged. Force yourself to choose your top three and complete your top three and begin to appreciate how much more productive you feel. I mean, I already know in my day that I have to go to work and accomplish a certain number of things. Um, those don't count. The three things on my list are things that are important to my life that I need to do to advance myself above and beyond just going through work and getting through um, my routine and the tasks that um, I know are waiting for me anyway. Uh, so this is a stretch to you know, do something beyond that. Like develop talks for camp meeting. You know, I will today do five more slides on a certain topic. Um, really helps move, move us along. And then things to avoid that can send your day off course. Again, more important tips, morning news. Do yourself a huge favor by missing out on all the upsetting things that happened around the world overnight. You don't need to know first thing in the morning. By lunchtime, the biggest news will have found its way to make it to you. It's not the way to get out of bed in the morning, and we can do better than that. Uh, me, the first thing, first thing I do after turning off my alarm, go to CNN.com on my phone, because I want to see what happened overnight. And, um, you know, not the healthiest routine, and, and um, something that needs to be changed. Uh, recommendations are not for a big breakfast. Your digestion is weakest in the morning. That might make you sluggish. Stick to a light breakfast. You can snack before lunch. That's not bad. Uh, stimulants, energy drinks, coffee are a crutch for a lack of sleep and poor nutrition. Try to drop the stimulants. Sleeping in. Stick to your new rituals without exception. Taking weekends off of your improved sleeping habits um, is only disruptive. You need to stay on course if you're really going to um, reap the benefits. So, so avoid cheating at those very tempting times. Another super important topic, and one that we probably should have talked about much earlier but didn't, is the business of body pH and total body alkalinity. And just how important that is and how we need to be aware of this. So is your pH acidic or basic? All foods are either acid or alkaline forming in your body. A food's pH nature is defined by the products of metabolism, not the pH outside your body. So it's what happens to that food when it's inside of you that determines whether it's supporting acidic or a basic environment. Alkalinizing foods. Um, potassium is a major alkalinizing force. So fruits and veggies high in potassium, and most of them have quite a bit, tend to be very alkalinizing. And another great reason to be eating lots of fruits and vegetables is it puts you um, away from that acidic state. Acid-forming foods are other things that we really do need, so it's not entirely avoidable. Proteins with sulfur and phosphorus content are acidic. Most grains, legumes, and nuts that we've been encouraging everyone to eat regularly, acid-forming. Processed and sugary foods are. Dairy products, meats, poultry are acid-forming. Tap water with a lot of chlorine. Coffee, soft drinks, alcohol, all biasing your system towards um, acid. Um, why is acid in the body unhealthy? Um, it impairs electron transport. We talked about mitochondria, about energy production. We're slowing that down and impeding that in an acidic environment, despite all the coenzyme Q10 we might be supplementing on. 
So reduces energy production, disrupts tissue and organ function. It's pushing you towards chronic fatigue, weakened immunity, so you're sick more. Um, increases chronic inflammation, predisposes you to cancer. So you have cell damaging um, free radical production without adequate antioxidant activity over time can predispose you to, to cancer. And if you deplete your alkalinizing bones or reserves, you'll have to rob your bones, dissolve your bones to generate minerals to neutralize acid environments to alkalinize your, your body and that will predispose you and push you faster towards osteoporosis. So protect your bones and you'll miss them when they're gone by encouraging your body to stay in an alkaline state. So how can we do that? Most people are too acidic and returning to an alkaline state is a major piece of, of the healing puzzle. pH less than seven is acidic, more than seven is basic or alkaline. Our ideal pH is slightly alkaline, 7.3 to 7.45. If you like, you could test your saliva with litmus paper. If you're like most people, including myself, you probably won't, but it's still nice to make those lifestyle changes and make those food selections that are deliberately predisposing us um, towards alkalinity. And as you might suspect, eating, drinking tap water um, or purified water, as well as our fruits and vegetables are all going to bias us towards an alkaline environment, whereas cheating on processed foods, fast foods, uh, colas, um, indulging in other substance that, substances that we probably shouldn't, drinking coffee, all biasing us towards um, an as, um, acidotic state. Hydration, with a new twist towards alkalinity. Start your day with water and lemon. Now here is a, a simple regimen. Half a cup of warm water. Squeeze in at least half a, a lemon or a lime. You can use a juicer or a blender. Drink water with lemon first thing in the morning on an empty stomach about one hour before meals for maximum results is best. And we're trying to hydrate while we bias ourselves towards alkalinity. And this is the wimpy version of lemon supplementation, just so you know. The heavy hitter is coming at the end. Um, but for the purposes of this article, this is what they're suggesting and promising you very interesting benefits. Alkalinizing effect helps fight diseases, it prevents cancers. Cancer, can, cancer cells can't survive in alkaline environments, so by staying in that state, you're naturally inhibiting cancer cells from establishing and growing. The um, lemon has a lot of electrolytes, potassium, calcium, magnesium. We talked about how important those were. There's a powerful antioxidant effect, so you're already protecting yourself from free radicals right out of the gate. Fights resp respiratory infections, other inflammation, cleanses the blood, helps lower blood pressure. A lemon a day can reduce your blood pressure by 10%. So if you're starting to struggle with high blood pressure and you're going on meds, your doctor's increasing your meds and you wish you didn't have to do that, here's something you may resort to that you might find is helpful. Um, aids in proper functioning of the nervous system, improves the skin. All that vitamin C is supporting connective tissue. It's gonna suppress hunger cravings. Alkalinity hastens weight loss. The citric acid is helping your gastric acid. Liver produces more enzymes from water with lemon than from any other food. And you want good liver, liver function, your biggest detoxifying organ. Water and lemon cleanses the liver, stimulates the liver to release toxins. So start drinking lemon water and stick with it for um, the health of your organs. In pregnancy, still take lemon water. Helps the unborn baby with bone tissue, that's from vitamin C, and brain and nervous development with the potassium. Helps you with um, natural bowel movements. Um, it can relieve heartburn. It's good for the joints. I had people in the back this week asking me about joint pain and what can they do in addition to ibuprofen and some of the powerful COX-2 anti-inflammatories. You know, we're all looking for home remedies and ways to improve ourselves naturally, and this could be a really good one. So try lemon water um, for your joint pain. Um, dilutes uric acid, you have less um, joint irritation from gout, for example. Um, can dissolve kidney stones, pancreas stones, calcium deposits, good for heart health, because calcium accumulates in our arteries, predisposes us to atherosclerosis and heart disease. Uh, so a great way to start your, to start your morning. 
And um, here's the, here's the um, hardcore lemon regimen, um, which I am planning to adopt. You take a lemon, hopefully it's organic, and you can get organic, you wash it, so it's got no, um, no um, chemical residues on it. You cut the whole thing up, do it in a blender, the whole thing, peels, seeds, everything, the whole lemon, add extra fresh squeezed lemon juice to really make that concentrate. You can add some honey for taste if you need, put that in the fridge, and every morning swallow a tablespoon. 30 times more powerful, they say, than, um, or as powerful as 30 lemons when it's concentrated in that form, including the peel, which still has so much goodness in it, and works as a natural chemotherapeutic agent. It's fighting cancer um, even before it starts, or in cancer patients who want to supplement their chemo regimen. This is a, a great thing to reach for. Um, as told to me by a number of very successful um, cancer patients who um, really live by this regimen. So, anyone in this audience not have cancer? Anyone in this audience not know if they have cancer? That's everybody who doesn't have cancer. So why don't we start protecting ourselves against cancers even now? This is the second leading cause of death in North American society. Statistically, statistically, a good number of us will ultimately succumb to cancer. Let's push our chronic conditions and life-threatening conditions off um, absolutely as far as possible. So exercising, we'll do a little bit on exercising, um, some surprising fundamentals, and this is really taking a new turn. So rather than some big comprehensive thing on all the way you can exercise, we'll focus on a couple of new ideas that are really um, making a lot of buzz in the headlines. Sitting is the new smoking, okay? Sitting is the new smoking. Smoking's been banned in public places, but exercise is not yet mandatory in public places and to protect us from the effects of sitting, maybe exercise should be mandatory and enforced in public places. So here is a graph showing time during your day spent sitting and your increased risk of death from that lack of activity and where it will cross the smoking threshold. 12 hours and above, you have almost the equivalent of a regular smoking habit. And how scary is that? So here is what some individuals are adopting for desks. This tread desk where you can actually be walking at a very slow pace while you work on your computer. Interesting. You know, during my clinics, I don't sit at all. I, I have a computer on a stand and I wheel it around, plug it in and out of rooms as I go, and I don't sit. That's helpful. You know, even nicer if you're actually on a treadmill and, um, and continuously walking, all to avoid this. So sitting the new, is the new smoking. Think of it as a risk equivalent and all the ways that it can harm you um, from your joints to your heart to your back to your stomach to your feet. Being sedentary is um, really our new problem. So sitting increases the risk of obesity. Here is a Mayo Clinic study. They took um, a group of subjects, controlled their diet and exercise. So they're all eating exactly the same and they're all exercising the exactly the same amount and then they added a thousand calories to everyone's diet. So some maintained their weights while others increased in weights. And it was a conundrum to understand why some were gaining weight and while others were not gaining weight without exercise. How did those not gaining weight keep from gaining weight? The conclusion was that those who maintained their weight, weight did so by unintentionally moving throughout the day. So it was all the random motion, the shuffling, the stretching, um, fidgeting, movements like this in those subjects which got the recognition for maintaining their weight at a normal level. It you know, gives us a sense for how important the little motions that we're making all the time are really contributing to our weight maintenance and ultimately to our longevity. So prolonged sitting can increase your risk of diabetes. Sitting for long periods of time affects blood sugar levels and insulin levels. Um, sedentary people are more likely to be obese. They're also more likely to develop um, type 2 diabetes. 18 studies, nearly 800,000 participants. Those who sat the most are twice as likely to develop diabetes. So 
the exercise recommendation, keep moving and be moving um, throughout, throughout your day. Even small motions add up and the idea is never to be completely still or completely still for a long time. Um, so highly sedentary have a greater chance of developing cancer. That's based on 4 million individuals who had over 68,000 cancers. Sitting for long periods increases risk of colon, endometrial, possibly lung cancer. Even in physically active individuals, so you're kind of athletic and fit, increased sitting in you can worsen with each two hour increase in your sitting time. So this is my problem. Kind of exercise intensely for a short period of time and otherwise spend long portions of my day relatively still at work and recognize the need to interrupt these things and take those opportunities to walk, lift your legs, swing your arms um, on two hour intervals could be absolutely critical to um, our long-term survival. Frequent sitters have an increased risk of developing heart disease, not surprisingly. 53,000 women, men, 69,000 females, 14-year follow-up. Those who sat more than six hours a day died earlier than their counterparts who limited sitting time to three hours a day or less. Higher rates of mortality among the frequent sitters. Association strongest for cardiovascular disease mortality, time spent sitting independently associated with total, total mortality regardless of the physical activity level. So even if you're really active some of the time, if you're spending the rest of the time sitting still, you're putting yourself at work, at risk. And suddenly those walking treadmill desks are starting to look um, very attractive for those of us who, who find ourselves sitting too much. Um, you can develop muscular issues while you sit. Muscles are usually supple and very flexible. They can become stiff. And if you keep this up for too long, it becomes a reason why perhaps elderly folks have a harder time getting along and around later in life because too much sitting during the years prior have stiffened the muscles such that um, motion becomes much more difficult and probably not reversible at those um, advanced ages. Sedentary individuals have a higher risk of depression. 9,000 middle-aged women um, studied and published on American Journal of Preventative Medicine with hours and hours of sitting associated with higher sickness and mortality rates who wouldn't be depressed. Um, sitting, uh, if nothing else, reduces, reduces the circulation of your feel-good hormones um, to the receptors because your feel-good hormones are sitting still in your blood, which isn't moving. So if, if you're going to actually benefit from those things being present, we have to circulate them. Those who sat for more than seven hours a day were 47% more likely to suffer from depression than those who sat four hours or less. Women who didn't exercise at all had a 99% higher risk of being depressed than those who met a minimum exercise requirement. So again, the importance of a little motion, a little motion and moving frequently um, is an idea we all need to grasp. And if we can get our minds around this and start to hang on to it, um, that one idea could serve us very, very well. Here is an encouraging study published this year, sitting, the two-minute solution. Short bursts of light activity, such as walking, cleaning, gardening, can boost longevity for people who are sedentary um, for more than half of their day. Two minutes of light intensity activity each hour um, lowers the risk of premature death by 33%. So if you find yourself needing to be still for long periods of time, probably every hour you can find two minutes to get out and walk, move, stretch, step outside, things like this, critical perhaps to our longevity. Add two minutes of walking each hour in combination with normal activities, which should add up to 2.5 hours of moderate type um, exercise per week. Really the formula to have that longevity benefit um, from exercise and not be disadvantaged um, because you're not moving enough. So we have about um, 35 minutes remaining and I'm really watching the time. This might be a nice time, kind of as a seventh inning stretch, if you wanna get up and stretch, look at the person on your right, look at the person on your left, thumbs up. And um, it's a long, these are long sessions and you guys are, um, everyone's really great in, um, in bearing with us. Nice, nice, living longer. 
This is what we're doing it every hour. With it, every hour, two minutes, perfect. Um, feel free to keep standing. But we talked, about, we touched about a, on a few of these things earlier. We have the population age above age 85 is the fastest growing in North America. The population over 100 doubling every decade since the 1950s. Chronic diseases more likely to kill people who only live to 80 or 90. Most centenarians dying from pneumonia or just frailty rather than cancer or heart disease. So they're avoiding those chronic conditions. Most more, and there are more centenarians, people over age 100 alive today than in past centuries. And that's also true of Canada. Statistics Canada expects a nine-fold increase in the number of centenarians during the next 50 years. That's a number reaching 62,000 by 2060 compared to just 7,000 in 2013. So Canada is expecting a surge in the centenarian population and um, how many people here want to be part of the centenarian population? Absolutely. And living well and enjoying life. So we have a distorted concept of aging in general. Um, a lot of people, in matter of fact, are afraid of living a long life. And you'll actually meet these folks and they'll admit to that when you talk to them. So poor lifestyle choices are made early on to have all the fun now and purposely trying to avoid that long life, which they're not looking forward to. These, in, these individuals can be very disappointed to find that they're in fact living with premature disability rather than premature death. So you're still alive, just your quality of life is very low um, because of some of the poor lifestyle cho choices that you made early on. Um, people say, if I had known I was going to live as long as I, as I am, um, I would have taken better care of myself because I'd like to still be um, enjoying my life, and now I'm not able to. So really, there is no need to grow old in the traditional sense of the world. word. We can continue everything um, that we enjoy now up until age 90. This is, should be the potential for really everyone. Most genetics, most people's genetics, will allow for great health into age 90, and hopefully beyond. So this should be... Uh, expectation that we all sort of have in, term, in terms of um, what's achievable for us. You might ask the question, why do some people age faster than others? And this is business of biologic versus chronologic age. And this was studied in 1,000 men and women in New Zealand, folks born 1972 to 73, lots of testing, kidney and liver function, lung capacity, metabolic immune function, cholesterol, blood pressure, dental status, eye structure, heart health, telomere length for the DNA. In 2011, when these subjects were aged 38, the biologic age, or how old their bodies were behaving, ranged from as young as 30 to as old as 60, when the actual chronologic age, what was on their driver's licenses, is only 38. Some gaining three biological years for every single chronologic years, years um, while others seem to have their biologic age essentially on pause. They're marching forward at time, but their bodies don't appear to be um, getting any older. You know, obviously that's the position that we'd like to be in. Um, the older your biologic age, worse performance on physical and mental acuity tests, worse balance and poorer motor coordination, more trouble climbing stairs, carrying your groceries, there was a clear relationship between looking older on the outside and aging faster on the outside. So it's going to show. And how possibly do we preserve our biologic age even when our chronologic age is unavoidably advancing? So you might be older than you think. How quick are you growing old? We recognize that we have to measure biologic aging faster and in a leaner and more efficient fashion. So we can reverse aging processes earlier because we're aware of them earlier before the person is showing exterior signs of being older or complaining about their health problems. We know that um, how fast older people walk is a very useful marker of their future health. Exercise can help you keep walking faster. Strength can improve through some resistance training. There's balance training regimens. A good index is preserving your ability to walk quickly. Um, so focus on that and use that as a little bit of a hallmark or um, checkpoint in your own life to your own advancement of biological age. 
the ends of life has its roots in early life. Investing in health in your middle age is going to have payoff in older age. Um, so lots of, lots of tips for us there. Medical disability versus great health at age 90. The World Health Organization says that you are likely to be medically disabled by age 69. That's the statistic um, nationally. Current life expectancy is now 79 years in the US. That tells you the last 10 years of your life, you will be lived with chronic medical conditions, lots of medications, and many doctor's visits. And believe me, I have scores of these sorts of folks in my clinic. You want to do the best you can for them, at the same time you feel sorry for people and wonder what life may have been if different decisions were made earlier. So again, living well until age 90 should be attainable, and why leave 21 high quality years on the table, as they say. So achieving greatest longevity, and this is um, results from what is known as the physician's health study, men versus women, disability versus longevity. In the US, men generally become medically disabled and die several years um, younger than women, we know this. It was observed that male physicians in the United States do seem to thrive. And so a study was proposed, what can we learn from long-lived male physicians who live to 90 and beyond without medical disability? And by the way, women's chance of hitting 90 is even higher, so let's learn from the weaker gender, if you like, and um, see what we can find. And this was a Harvard study, and here we see um, three generations of Harvard cardiologists, in call, including a grandfather of modern cardiology, who's um, Dr. Eugene Braunwald, and um, not sure his age, I'm quite sure it's above 80, and um, still goes to work every day, lectures, and um, uh, making an active contribution. So the physician health study from Harvard, there was number one, this was from 1982 to 1995, and they were really looking at aspirin and some supplements, and the second one looking at more supplements and multivitamins. Those study, those conclusions were um, not too impressive, but in the process they were able to identify seven factors critical to longevity in these male US docs, all right? If you follow all seven, you're likely to be alive and well at age 70. If you miss even one, according to their results, you are not likely to make it or be doing well at age 90. So what seven factors were um, identified in this study? First was don't smoke. Every cigarette costs 11 minutes of your life, adds up to dying 10 years earlier, rapid aging and premature medical disability. So no smoking if you wanna make it to 90. If you smoke or you have smoked, don't throw in the towel, you can regain those life years, you don't have to be the statistic, but let's recognize um, what the studies have shown. Prevent or reverse your diabetes. Uh, diabetes can subtract statistically nine years from your life, medical disability 20 years earlier. 90% of adult onset diabetes is thought to be completely preventable. And even if it is genetically or medically not possible to reverse your diabetes, do everything you can to keep your hemoglobin A1C levels in the normal range, or at least as close to normal range as possible. Give yourself the best chance of minimizing um, complications for, from diabetes. Check your blood pressure. High blood pressure wears out your heart, arteries, and other organs. Your goal is 120 over 80. Anything old over is probably aging you somewhat. Can cost you five years of high quality life from heart attack and other problems. Many patients can reverse high blood pressure and get off medications with an unwavering commitment to a healthy lifestyle. So if blood pressure is an issue, Stay on your medications to keep your blood pressure normal. Work at your life um, style to be able to reduce those doses and hopefully come off of a few agents. What is your blood pressure? That's the pressure that your arteries require for your heart to fill them. So the higher your blood pressure, the higher your peripheral vasculature is demanding of your heart to fill. So if your heart has to generate higher pressures every time to fill your blood vessels, and it's doing that 100,000 times a day, like we said, for days, weeks, months, years at a time, you can believe that over days, weeks, months, and years, that your heart is going to start experiencing fatigue and it's gonna add up 
and predispose you to heart failure and um, premature death. So maintaining our blood pressure at optimal levels, one of the single most important things that we can do for our own, long own, long own longevity. Physical activity, every hour of sitting costs 22 minutes of your life. Any form of sitting, you can ask how much is watching TV costing you? The physicians in the health study living to age 90 um, and beyond were physically active their entire um, lives. And in case you think they might be ahead of you or you can never keep up, FYI, it takes a lot of sitting to become a doctor. So they have spent a significant amount of time sitting, I can promise you that. Um, life is full of second chances, it's what you do with the rest of your time. It's not what you did, it's what you do next. That's um, a, uh, an expression that I've appreciated. Maintaining a lean body weight. Um, so physicians above age 90 were a lean group, average body mass index of 24. 25 or higher is considered overweight. Obesity can cost you nine years. Like diabetes, you can be t medically disabled 20 years earlier if you're always packing around a lot of weight. Your lean body weight is the weight of your vital organs and essential tissues without the fat. As we age, typically like this yellow line goes, age 10 up to age 80, our weight tends to slowly increase. While it is increasing, our lean body mass is typically declining, so our muscles are atrophying and going away, and those are being replaced with fat, such that our overall weight is increasing. We want to be aware of this process and actively preserving our lean body mass our lean body mass, your muscle mass. So activities that strengthen and replace muscle, very important as we get older. And let's not be fooled and say just because our weight is basically the same, that our body composition is basically the same. Expect this shift to be happening. Lean body mass declining while fat stores are, are increasing and engage in those processes to maintain your lean body weight. Education. Many studies have shown that more education and you are more likely to avoid medical disability and live a long life. If you've not finished high school, that can cost you nine years of life. Not finished college, that can cost you five years of life. It's never too late. There's online courses. Studying now may help you avoid Alzheimer's later. Let's be aware that our education level might be important. If you have a low educational level, keep studying, stay interested, keep reading. Um, if you have education, don't get sluggish. We recognize that overall um, it's protective. Finally, number seven from the physician health study, a calling in life. And most physicians felt that their occupation was a calling in life. So this kind of came easily. Little, there was little separating work and personal. Um, driven by a desire to help people and that improving health and longevity. A strong sense of purpose is thought to be worth about four years of life. Having no purpose, just existing, puts you at risk for Alzheimer's disease. So explore why you are here on earth. Ask the bigger questions. Decide what legacy you want to leave behind and um, commit your life to having a meaningful result. And it's no late to, no late, not, never too late to start. And having some guiding sense of purpose and a strong sense of purpose um, is something we should pursue deliberately for the sake of um, prolonging our lives and staying healthy. Factors surprisingly not associated with health and long longevity in that study. And it's interesting because next we're going to look at the blue zones where some of these things were important. But the idea of being um, socially connected. Physicians feel needed and connected anyway because of their jobs, so they didn't need a lot of socialization outside of that. Um, Dr. John Day, who was part of this article, says, every week I go to church, at least several neighbors will come up to me and ask me for help regarding a medical situation medical <coughs> situation, and that's part of his contribution, very interestingly. I think that's also a reason why some physicians don't go to church. Um, nevertheless, that social connectedness um, kind of gets built in. Wine consumption showed no benefit in the physician health study. Cholesterol numbers, the older you get, cholesterol numbers don't seem to matter as much. And it's true, those risk factors are kind of in place and the absolute number doesn't seem to matter. And that shouldn't surprise us based on our discussion of cholesterol. 
particle size versus absolute number versus oxidized cholesterol versus not oxidized cholesterol. There's ways where we can increase particle size. There's ways to protect our cholesterol from oxidative damage, make that number really a benign number and um, not something that's going to dictate what happens to us and um, how early we may pass away. Um, so make it work for you. You don't have to be a physician to enjoy great health at 90. From this article, strict adherence to a lifestyle study shows that most Seventh-day Adventists Mormons and Okinawans can live to age 90. So if you know any Seventh-day Adventists, you might want to talk to them and ask them what it is about their lifestyle that's unique and consider adopting those things for yourself. Um, you can continue to enjoy excellent health to age 90 and beyond. That should be possible for almost anyone with any genetic um, composition. Unhealthy lifestyle choices now, is it really worth um, being medically disabled um, 20 years younger? Really, it's not. And as soon as that happens, um, you'll wish we had, you had tried earlier, tried harder earlier. We can avoid this scenario, someone looking a little haggard, a little, a little beaten down, list a pres uh, prescription list longer than your arm, and um, wondering how they're ever going to come off of these pills. Um, believe me, this is not um, the place where we want to be if we can at all avoid it. And we're here to talk about ways avoiding, um, to avoid exactly that um, scenario. And believe me, I see it um, all the time. So achieving greatest longevity. Societies with outstanding longevity and what can we learn? This was studied in a book, book called The Blue Zones, looking at geographic areas where people live much longer. Japan, Greece, Italy, Costa Rica, Loma Linda, California. What characteristics account for tremendous longevity in individuals living, living in this places, place and what can we learn from them? And what do they all share in common, which is predisposing them to excellent um, longevity? Very interesting and remarkable how long some people are living and how well they are doing in certain regions. It's really quite striking because we don't live surrounded by these kinds of folks. So our conception of what might be possible and what might even be routine in some places gets a little bit um, colored. So nine similarities in the blue zones. Plant power, eating veggies way more than meats or processed foods. 80% rule, stop eating when you're 80% full. When you feel 80% full, because you really are full, you don't want to burn your engines harder than you need to. Red wine showed up, purple grapes can substitute. We saw from the physician health study that red wine was not a longevity signal. Activity, make moving unavoidable. If you live in Okinawa, you might not have any chairs in your house, so you spend all day getting up and down off the floor. Okay, that's good for you because if you can keep doing, if you're doing that every day, you're going to do it much longer than somebody who's um, not doing that every day. Downshift, work less, slow down, rest. Diffusing stress was uh, just a huge part of their success. The idea of a plan de vida, having a purpose in life, belonging to a healthy social network, having spiritual or religious belief and participation, longevity, strong sense of pride, of tribe, making your family a priority and being um, involved in your family. And we have examples of longevity record holders. Here's the longest living woman in recent history um, from France, Jean-Louis Calmet. If you asked her what she did, she would say laughter, immune to stress, olive oil and some port wine were her secrets. You are not a statistic. This lady smoked one cigarette per day for 96 years while having her glass of wine. She ate nearly one kilogram of chocolate per week, which might actually, actually have been doing her a tremendous favor. On her 22nd, 122nd and final birthday, she threw down a challenge. She said, 122 years, can anyone beat that? <laughs> and so far, no one's beat that. You're welcome to challenge her. Here's a gentleman who lived to be age 113. What was his success? Healthy diet, no cigarettes, no alcohol, milk every afternoon. Hard to argue with somebody when they're that age. Um, strong sense of purpose. Here's a British stockbroker, saved almost 700 children during um, the Holocaust. He won the White Lion Award um, in Prague at age 105. And here he is at the time of that award, age 105. 
I'd like to be looking that good at um, age 105. Um, personality secrets of the centenarians. We talked about these. Do you have the right personality to live to be 100? Um, 4,400 people in the U.S. Um, lived, um, 4,400 people in the U.S. Um, are at age 100 right now. Living to 100, not determined by lucky genes. About 25% of is genetic, 75% of longevity. To 100 is lifestyle choice. Lifestyle is affected by your personality because we choose what to do each day based on our personality. Personality gives you your priorities, your stress level, your mindset, your relationships, and more. So you can adopt an appropriate personality to bias you towards uh, longevity. What did these people find? Multiple centenarian studies, people living beyond 100. They're easygoing, they're optimistic, they love to laugh, they're outgoing. Traits may be partly due to genes, but also highly influenced by behavior. So, what is it about being easygoing? Stress and anxiety really do age us rapidly. They shorten our telom telomeres. They're degrading the quality of our DNA. Laid back is associated with healthier DNA and longevity. Optimists eat right, they exercise, they believe they'll live longer, so they take care of themselves. Buys them eight years on average. Laughter has all sorts of physiologic, psychologic, social, spiritual, quality of life benefits. People who laugh regularly are at lower risk of heart attack because they're always diffusing that stress. Outgoing, um, make friends and form meaningful relationships, elevates your mood, diffuses stress. Spend time with children for the purpose of silly play and to laugh, leave your serious focus behind. You can watch comedies. Recall that other people are, at least 90% of other people are also shy, help you be more outgoing. Keep it in mind to your advantage. Reach out to make a social connection. Have the thought to develop a new friend every day. Not that you're gonna do it because you don't meet that, run into that many people necessarily, but if you have that goal, it changes your outlook and you're watching for chances to go up to people and meet them, listen to them, make a connection, have a new friend, even if you don't really like doing it. I'm an introvert, I, I get it. Um, those social connections and possibly more for introverts really are um, strong and pulling us in the direction of um, longer life. So a few more tips, that 10 year perspective, is it important 10 years? If not, let it go. Eliminate the clutter, only say yes to um, essential things on purpose, say no to a lot of good but really non-essential things, don't become frazzled and overwhelmed. Keep a gratitude journal to help maintain your optimism. Have physical activity, it boosts your feel-good hormones, sense of well-being, helps you relax. Uh, lots of tips um, for living to 100. Super centenarians, super centenarians, what are those? Those are people who live to 110 and beyond. I'd like to live to 110 and beyond. There's about 60 in the US and 300 worldwide at any one time, people living to 110 years and beyond and doing it well people really living to the limit of the human lifespan right now. Beyond 100, less time is spent with age-related diseases like cancer, heart disease, dementia, or stroke. Physically and mental sharp for a greater proportion of your life if you're at 110. You're behaving like those 10, 20, 30 years your junior. These folks seem to compress the time with disability and disease to the very, very ends of their lives. And... Um, yeah, that's conclusions that have been made from carefully studying these particular individuals. If you are a centenarian, you're alive at 100, you're one of three. You're a survivor, meaning you were diagnosed with an age-related illness before 80, but you made it anyway. You're a delayer. You had no age-related illness um, till at least age 80. Or you're an escaper. You had no age-related illness at all um, before age 100. You tend to fall into one of those categories. Some people do persist despite deadly diseases, put off acquiring diseases longer, and avoid diseases um, altogether. One of these categories, impressive lack of disability in the centenarians, 90% and above living independently at age 93, dealing with disease much better than others. So those coping mechanisms just tend to be very good. Compared to centenarians, super centenarians, 
have shorter and shorter periods of disease and disability before they died. It's this compression of morbidity hypothesis. Any disease they squished into a very small portion of their life that was um, right at the end. Supercentenarians, all 300, delay any disease toward the end of their lives, unlike older people in the general population or other centenarians who are very mixed in terms of what diseases um, they have and when they got them. So these people aren't experiencing disease early. To get to that 110 group, it's really almost no disease um, right to the end. So that puts you in a very unique pod. Um, it's largely genetic. The longer you live, the more your genes take credit. About 20% of living to age 85 or 90 is genetic. That influence is much higher once you hit about 106. A winning combination of genes protects you, protects you from most or even all of the age-related diseases. Just lucky. It's like eight or nine lucky draws out of 10. Not just one lucky draw. You really did win the lottery over and over again. And studying these people may hold the key to treatments for diseases that are killing the rest of us. Um, and as the author of the Centenarian Studies um, would conclude, and I, I love this quote, he says, for now, um, the best bet for living beyond 78.8, which is the average life expectancy in the United States, is prevention. His quote, if we want to see average life expectancy go up, we have to start acting like Seventh-day Adventists, who have been shown to live longer thanks to their vegetarian, active, drug, alcohol, and smoking-free lifestyle. So off to a, you know, a great model that's recognized um, in the medical literature and demonstrated to be um, a high longevity group in the blue zone, um, a book by Dan Putner. What we want to do is be a part of that population and even make that population even more um, exemplary by being meticulous um, with our commitment to lifestyle and prevention. A few tips to age grace gracefully for nice skin, Sunscreen, moisturizer, and retinoid cream. Um, you start at age 20, your skin will continue to look much younger. Retinoids are where the magic happens. This vitamin A derivative teaches your skin to act young again, stimulates collagen, prevents the fine lines. So if you want to keep looking young and smooth while you live forever, um, that really may be where the magic is happening. Get a move on, we talked about it. Catch enough sleep, um, we talked about it. Um, all sorts of benefits. Embrace your grays. Gray hair can look stunning. It can be sophisticated if you have the right haircut or do. Um, exude confidence. Let's not try to look longer and fake everyone necessarily. Um, goal is to look your best every day. Positive beliefs about aging can help you live 7.5 years longer. So let's go for confidence. Proud of who you are. Proud of the age you are and um, you're already going to look younger and um, you'll probably live longer as well. Revise your style. If you're stuck in a style rut or a time warp, changing it is an expression of what you're sending out to the world, what's going on inside of you, and um, really that can be energizing. A 2010 study showed that women who got their hair colored or cut and thought they looked younger had lower blood pressure. So they showed a positive correlation between looking good, feeling good about how you look, and some hard health endpoints that we're all pursuing. Um, after age 50, it comes down to those who are aging versus those who are aging gracefully. Are you one of those who is getting better and better with each passing year or someone else? Um, the graceful agers are aging smarter. That's what they're doing. Um, it's what they aren't doing that's um, helping them age successfully. Uh, don't wear too much makeup. It really isn't making you more attractive. Use makeup to enhance your natural beauty. Keep your makeup clean and natural in appearance. Are you getting too much TV? This is that sitting problem. If you're too comfortable, it's particularly dangerous if you're older. Valuable time just slipping through your fingers. Every hour of TV watched after age 25, costing you 22 minutes of life expectancy by some estimates. Every hour after the age 25, costing you 22 minutes of life. So. For everyone here who's over the age of 25, you know, time to really rein in your um, TV watching. Puts you vulnerable to sedentary lifestyle and social isolation as you get um, all of your socialization or more of it from this inanimate ob object that, you'll, that will never um, reciprocate. Again, attention to stress. Stress is unavoidable. We all have family work and finances. 
can cause a barrage of health problems, sleeplessness, depression, heart disease. Stress can make you appear 10 years older. People who age gracefully learn to manage their stress. It's the experience of the stress that's um, so devastating. If it's meditation or exercise, taking a couple minutes for yourself, unplug from the technology, walk away from it, um, good for your health. Highly beneficial, for, highly, highly beneficial for your inside and your outside to um, tame stress. And this has been a really conscious part of, um, of um, my focus in recent years. Overindulging, sure you should live a little, we all feel we should. Moderation is key to aging gracefully. Whatever your vice, fatty foods, sweets, sodas, coffees, whatever you're cheating on and know you shouldn't um, and probably won't give up, moderation is, is really the key. And we can all improve our, our temperance. Um, so to summarize, we've talked about a couple of things, important topics, um, you know, not to be underestimated in their contribution to the quality of our lives and our longevity. Our sleep, it's a quarter of your life, um, so do it well. We talked about morning routines to get our day and each day off to on the best start possible. We talked about the importance of alkalinity and using lemon water, that whole lemon, the entire thing ground up where we're taking a teaspoon daily, you know, halting the aging process in your body, really giving you a strong bias towards no cancer, a very important part of our routines. Longevity, we talked about biological aging and the importance of actually knowing our biological age, not just our chronologic age on our, on our um, you know, driver's licenses. We talked about the physician health study, blue zones for longevity. We talked about living to 90s. All of us should be able to live into our 90s. Centenarians, not out of reach for most people. Super centenarians, probably lucky genes. Maybe you got them. Only one way to find out, and that's to live that old. Um, aging gracefully, sunscreen, moisturizer, retinoids, let's not avoid, that's also protecting you from cancer, style, confidence, makeup, and we talked about the importance of man minimizing stress and um, not overindulging. Wonderful. I know my chances of living um, longer are much better, I think, from having prepared these talks and make, making some lifestyle adjustments already. And there's um, many more things on this slide that I have a commitment to. And really appreciated doing this and our time together. Again, to review our program, and so many people said they want to see the slides, review the notes, because they are dense. And it behooves all of us to think through this material um, on, multiple, on multiple sittings. So. You can buy these things through um, the bookstore here. Otherwise, I'll make them available on my website, no charge. It'll be a few weeks, uh, so be patient. If you go to the website, you'll be prompted here to enter your email address. If you enter your email address, you will get an email that says this is um, um, where the presentations are and how you can access them. So I want to thank you all again for for um, just a tremendous week.